know why I started making videos on games in the first place? It's because games, well, games are the best form of storytelling out there. So today, I'm gonna show you why. I've always been a sucker for a really good story, whether that be for my favorite movies like Ex Machina and Everything Everywhere All at Once, memorable books I read as a kid like Ender's Game, or even just listening to the journeys of successful and hardworking people nowadays on podcasts. But the reason I don't have a channel dedicated to those things is because I think that games hold a uniquely fascinating place in the realm of storytelling. A place that elevates them above everything else out there because of one special thing all games have that no other medium does. But we'll get to that. You might already have a guess as to what it is. Because you see, video games haven't even been around that long. It was only at the dawn of the 1980s that we first saw Pac-Man, and only decades later did games with a focus on storytelling first, even more than gameplay, really become ubiquitous and popular. For so long, games were seen as nothing more than a fun and nerdy distraction. I distinctly remember debates about whether or not video games were even art when I was growing up, whereas nowadays, it feels like most successful movies and TV shows are based on games rather than the other way around. Funny how the tables can turn so quickly. But truthfully, a lot of what got games this far in the first place was what they were able to garner from their competition as well. From movies, game designers learned how important camera angles, good dialogue, set dressing, and compelling music was. From books, an importance in lore and world building to the point where now, oftentimes in games, you will find tons of journal entries or notes scattered all over the world that tell stories of past events in the universe. Or what about things like environmental storytelling in Bethesda games? The reason things like that work so well in the first place is they capture a similar essence of the mystery and wonder we find in books, where we get to paint a story as to what happened in our own heads. And what makes all of these things great is that they speak to us on so many different levels. It's why prominent storytellers are extremely popular in the first place, their ability to capture our hearts and souls using all of the tools at their disposal to craft interesting and memorable narratives narratives that we'll never forget. But despite all of that, games have one thing that all of these other mediums don't. Whether that be movies, television, radio, or anything where you don't have a controller, mouse, or VR tracker in your hand. Something that makes them the apex of storytelling and the future of most of our nostalgia, by my estimations at least. And that's giving the player a true and meaningful sense of agency. The power to craft a journey all to our own, in and outside of our head. In fact, I'll give you an example. When you're watching a scary movie or show, the tension mostly comes from pre-planned and designed scenes. That cut in the camera right as the music starts to crescendo, the unnerving and haunting framing of a shadow that doesn't look quite right, or zooming in on a character's face as that big revelation hits. But the problem with these things is it isn't something we did, it's just something that was done to us. And in fact, not even to us, just a character we're looking at or reading about. And there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that. It's okay to have set pieces and moments that are perfectly designed for the viewer. Things like Freddy Krueger reaching through the bed in Nightmare on Elm Street seared itself into children's minds for a reason. And even in games like, say, Mass Effect, it feels like you can't even go 10 minutes without a cutscene playing out with pre-panned camera angles and music to the point where sometimes you may as well be watching that next Netflix special. The thing is, though, there really is a big difference when you're in control. When you you play a game like Alan Wake 2, one of the scariest in recent memory, the most horrifying scenes almost always come from those times when you have a controller in your hand, not when you're simply watching a scene. Because it's one thing hearing that ominous bell chime as the villain chases down an actor in a movie or cutscene, but when you are quite literally the person running away, it completely changes the experience. In a movie, for example, you can always close your eyes, cover your ears, or like me, use your non-existent girlfriend as a human shield. 
But when you're playing a game, your entire survival completely relies on you and you alone. Being chased by that scary monster while having to keep your cool and run in and out of buildings and through small openings in the forest brings the tension to a whole new level. And when you're playing a game, you get to set the scene. Every moment and interaction is entirely dictated by your decisions. If you decide to stop mid-escape and turn around and shine your flashlight at a menacing creature and scream, that leaves so much more of an impact than just watching or reading about the same thing happening. In a game, things happen to you because you actually have agency and control of what's going on. And with great power comes great responsibility, but also an even greater sense of satisfaction. When a character in a scary book or film slays the monster, you feel a sense of relief. But in a game, you feel not only relief, but pride too. And that's more powerful than words could even express. Because well, just like how games excel based on agency, just hearing something or seeing it can't replace that sense of truly experiencing it. A director or writer can always set the stage, create a formidable sense of dread or an ominous backdrop, but what happens on that easel is completely outside our hands. In games, however, there's something truly magical about creating that story on our own, about becoming the character and absorbing the feelings and things they experience firsthand. When I'm playing Alan Wake 2, the majority of the horror comes from the fact that I'm literally being hunted, not just something on screen or in my mind is scary with haunting music to boot. And that's exactly what makes games so special and so riveting in how they tell stories. That sense of horror, of accomplishment, of pride, or of shame in completing or failing at a task because, well, it's all on you, not some fake character in a medium you can't even interface with. Because sure, the character you're playing as in whatever video game you happen to be in is anything but real. However, the decisions you make and how the game reacts to you because of them is about as real as it can get. Consequences too are at the heart of why stories and games are on a completely different level. But we see this in other types of games too. Take even your run-of-the-mill multiplayer game that is completely focused on engaging gameplay and combat with almost no story. Things like CSGO, Dota, StarCraft, and Valorant. Even in titles like this, it's the stories that we tell ourselves that really last with us. That insane 1 vs 5 situation where you barely survived and won the round for your whole team, that combo you pulled off with a complete stranger to win an objective back, or a heroic comeback that had both teams on the edge of their seats for almost an hour. Things like this aren't traditional narratives, but what they are is something a lot more meaningful than that. Stories that aren't told through the imagination of someone else and lived out through our senses looking at a screen or page of text, but journeys that we actually experience firsthand and narratives that form because of the actions we've taken to get there. Or what about massive open worlds like World of Warcraft, full of epic storylines with kings, dragons, and hot traitorous elves? You would think the narrative would be what we remember most, those planned out and heroic sagas that the entire series is based on, like the fall of Arthas into the Lich King. Despite how great and memorable moments like that are, still the most riveting stories always come from the friends you made along the way, the guild drama that resulted after that crazy guy ninja looted gear again, or when you finally for the first time took down the Lich King in a massive raid in his own domain, surrounded by the people that worked so hard to get there. For as great as all the cinematics and cutscenes were with epic music and badass battle scenes that set the stage, the part that makes us feel most nostalgic was the journey we actually took to stop him ourselves, and the friends we made along the way. It's so much more impactful when we are the ones doing something, when the course of a fable is at least in part dictated by our own will and volition. Because as human beings, we crave that sort of attention, that tactile and immediate or even long-term reaction from a world to the person we've become in it. That sense of power and self-determination is at the core of the human spirit, to forge a path in a blaze of glory into the person we become. In an RPG like Baldur's Gate 3 or The Outer Worlds, for instance, deciding to make a dumb character and seeing NPCs react realistically to the crazy and wild things we say is what real adventure and storytelling is all about. It might not even be what the creators intended for most people to do or experience, but that's what makes it special to the player. After all, most stories at least in part are an adventure, but in my opinion, the pinnacle of those is almost always the moments that speak to us personally. Moments 
that teach us a lesson we'll never forget because we relate to it so heavily. And what better way is there to do that than with a story crafted from our own actions? Even in titles like Dark Souls or Elden Ring, that sense that you must explore on your own and do so much detective work to understand what's going on makes the storytelling so much more interactive and rewarding. A lack of any main quest and objectives can be confusing at first, but allows players to venture out into a universe on their own and discover how to beat bosses, how to unlock special treasure, and what to do next. I'll never forget stumbling upon the Shofra River for the first time after accidentally finding a massive elevator that took me deep underground and being met with a bewildering cavern with a ceiling full of not stalactites, but a sea of never-ending stars. And this wound up with a story and moment I'll never forget. One that had no characters, no main driving goal, and no dialogue, just my own will and ability to press on. The type of adventure you couldn't ever truly capture in something like a movie, a book, or a song. And in truth, it's the key ingredient that gives storytellers in games a unique and advantageous position when compared to all other mediums we know and love. But what about a more direct comparison, like for like, tit for tat, of a story from a game that on its own merits and abilities trumps anything other media could ever do and proves why games are the pinnacle of storytelling with specific examples? Well, I'll prove it with my favorite game of all time and also the one that inspired this video the most, Cyberpunk 2077. And fair warning, I'll be spoiling some of the game and endings here. You see, in Cyberpunk, you assume the role of V, a man or woman on the path of a lowly mercenary who becomes tied up in something so much bigger than they could ever imagine. And along this journey, you come across countless bloody fights and horrifying dives into the darkest points of humanity. But along the way too, you also begin to know and understand some of the most realistic and deep characters ever put to a game, resulting in moments like sitting next to Judy and holding her close as she cries over the body of her dead friend in a bathtub covered in blood or sitting with Pan Am around a campfire or broken down shack and hearing the subtle happiness in her voice when she speaks to you. Looking out into the distance of the oil fields late at night as a previous terrorist and rocker boy celebrity pours out his heart and soul onto you about how he never had any real friends anyways. And in each of these, you aren't simply absorbing the scene, you're part of it. You can look in the direction when Johnny points to his burial site, or decide how fast or slow to walk towards Pan Am on her bike in the morning, almost like being an actor in a play rather than a nobody in the audience. And it's that rawness and intensity, or in some cases, if you so will it, the pure comedy and absurdity of it all that really makes all of these scenes so personal, even when every player sees them in almost the same way. And that's just how it is in games, where the art is quite literally in the hands of the beholder, not just the eyes. Destiny determined through input, not outside forces. Or in other words, art confined to the same realm that we live in, the present, rather than just being like pen to paper, film to reel, or melody to track, always stuck in the past. The real crowning achievement of games though isn't just these moments, it's what happens when we act on them, like at the end of Cyberpunk where we see a perfect example of the unfair advantage storytelling in games really has. Early on in the main quest, you learn that your player character V only has a couple months to live unless they can get a top secret biochip out of their head, and that results in you making a very tough decision at the conclusion. If you want to save your life, you can attempt to get help from either an evil corporation that was your adversary the whole game, Arasaka, or side with their rival who isn't much better despite the act they put on, that being the NUSA in the Phantom Liberty DLC. Or you can even test your luck by trusting a strange blue-eyed man who's been following you around all game to go to a floating city in space called the Crystal Palace looking for salvation in your last breath. But in each of these specific endings, you leave everyone behind. That man stuck in your head, the girl who rode through the badlands with you to your heart's content, or a friend who felt vulnerable enough to take you to her childhood home, now covered underwater, and open up to you about the pain and suffering she's been through. You lose the people you held closest, the ones that matter to you the whole time. And it's only by choosing all of the other endings to this game, like giving up your body to Johnny Silverhand to live out the rest of his life of kindness he never got to, forgiving Somi for her lies and choosing her future over yours, or sailing away on a basilisk tank towards Arizona with a girl you love knowing you'll most likely die soon, that you realize what really matters. Because you see, the true message of cyberpunk is an answer to a question asked at the very 
very beginning of the game, or Dex, a fixer who hires mercenaries, ponders if you would rather go out in life dying in a blaze of glory, or live the quiet life and forever be forgotten. And it's in these endings you realize that the true answer was always the quiet life. That the people around us, the ones we love, and the ones who love us, are more important than living out our dreams as a famous and powerful person who dies in glory. Because in every ending where you try to save yourself instead of others, you lose in the end, now becoming the person you always dreamed of, but more alone than ever. But what makes this moment so special in a game, you might still be wondering. Why does this moment hit so much harder than it does in other media? After all, it certainly isn't the first time this lesson's been taught in art. I've seen countless movies, read countless books, and listened to hundreds of songs that tackle the same subject matter with the same exact takeaways. It's because you make that decision in a game. At the end of Cyberpunk, you don't watch as the story forces you down a specific path to preach what it's trying to say. You have to make that decision, and you get to decide what's right. No lesson was pre-planned and had to be carried out in a certain way. Only you can dictate the story. So when you finally do make that decision, it hits so much harder. Like on my first playthrough of the game, where I was met with this harrowing conclusion, and immediately the first thing that came to my mind was Judy, Pan Am, Johnny, Takamura, and all of the people I met and cared for along the way. Throughout the entire game, I was so focused on leveling up my character, getting better gear, and becoming the best in all of Night City, just like my V proclaimed they wanted from the start. But when faced with that decision at the end, something hit me in a profound way. Abandoning all of those that helped me in order to save myself wasn't a worthy sacrifice at all. The quiet life, not a blaze of glory, was the true meaning to glean. I thought back to Pan Am around the campfire bringing me into a family V never had, or Judy who would lose the one person left in her life after everyone else died or abandoned her. Or what about Johnny, a man many would call evil that now would never get his chance at redemption at becoming a good man ever again. In fact, there's even an ending to this game, one most people haven't seen, where V can choose the ultimate sacrifice, of ending their own life because of how hard the world is, because it's just not worth it. After all the pain and destruction you have seen, you can decide at the very last moment to give up on the world because it's just not worth the suffering. But in that ending, you then have to watch as each character calls you crying, screaming, and filled with pain and agony at the decision you've made. Judy has lost everything she has ever had and can't even bear to stand up as she chokes on her words with tears streaming down her face. Pan Am is furious at your cowardice, abandoning an entire family that cared about you like the Aldecaldos. And Vic sits still in disbelief with an understanding of the pain you've gone through wishing you the best. Seeing the immense agony you have caused these characters because of a decision you made, not one the game had you follow down some pre-planned route to make a point, makes it hit all that harder because you realize the effect your choices, your actions, can have on the people around you. And this has got to be by far the most powerful anti-self-harm message I've ever seen in any media by far because it really feels more personal when you're the one who actually made the horrible decision to end it at all, especially when it didn't have to end like this, it's all your fault. So watching those consequences play out is horrifying because you feel like you almost have blood on your hands, that you ruined other people's lives with no one to blame but yourself. And even as someone who doesn't deal with feelings like this in my real life and just wanted to see what all of the endings in this game were like, I struggled to get through watching all of the videos here because I felt guilty for making a decision that was just meant to be fun and to see what the other endings were like. That's why storytelling in games is so powerful. I've never felt guilty watching a movie or reading a book, but I struggled to not shut the game down when Judy came up on a video call crying after what I did. It's the same reason why, for those of you who don't know, over 95% of players in things like Mass Effect or Dragon Age play as the good guy. Because when you choose the asshole option and end up making a character cry, it feels a lot more impactful than watching another character in a book or movie do the same thing. So often players just end up reloading their save and doing the good thing all over again, not being able to bear the brunt of the sadness they inflict otherwise. And really stop and think about that just for a moment. 
Games as a storytelling device are so engaging and so memorable that people literally struggle to do certain things because of the simple fact that they're in the driver's seat. For instance, it's easy to watch Jason Bourne or James Bond kill whoever they want, but if you're playing a game like Last of Us or Red Dead Redemption and suddenly an enemy you hit in the stomach is on the ground bleeding out, screaming, and begging for their life and family, the entire scene becomes a lot more excruciating than just sitting back and enjoying a cool action sequence. When when you're the one that decides to pull the trigger, you have a lot more responsibility, and because of that responsibility, the story feels that much more immersive and real. And it's also the same reason so many people prefer movies or books over games. The amount of effort, time, and potential turmoil you have to put yourself through to experience some games is so much greater, but so is the payoff. And you know, another part of the beauty of storytelling in games is that other people who play can have a completely different takeaway and do completely different things. For example, I've seen countless comments under some of my videos about how cyberpunk is actually the opposite of my interpretation, about how the blaze of glory is the only way out and the right choice, not the quiet life. And it's the fact that players are given agency to decide that for themselves, and more importantly, act on it, that makes storytelling in games so beautiful. Because while movies, books, and music might offer those who experience them a chance to interpret them differently too, they don't offer them a chance to craft a narrative of their own with a real agency and real consequence. The most crucial ingredients to immersion and learning, and also the types of journeys that we all crave deep within our hearts and souls. An adventure that lasts with us so much longer because we're the ones who sung its most important notes. Storytelling where the main character isn't V, isn't Alan Wake, Kratos, Joel and Ellie, John Marston, or whoever the hell this is. And do you know what that's called? A hero's journey. The exact same we're all going on right now. You know, a lot of you might not know this, but before I ever started making videos like this one here, I actually was mainly streaming on Twitch. For years, I struggled to learn how to make content, how to entertain people, and just figuring out how the industry really works. Finding myself with only momentary bouts of success that were quickly followed by long stretches of no viewership and mental anguish. And during that period, I watched countless videos online from creators like Harris Heller, Devin Nash, or Asmongold about how to grow your stream, how to keep viewers engaged, and how to build your brand and business. But do you know what I learned after all those hours listening to them? Nothing. No matter how many self-help, tips and tricks, or motivational videos I watched, nothing changed. I kept failing over and over again, my viewership would fluctuate drastically day to day, and I felt like I just wasn't good enough. And the thing is, it wasn't their fault. In fact, the videos, the advice, it was all fantastic and coming from creators at the top of their craft with great insights that made a lot of sense. They knew what they were talking about. But you see, the issue is, there just aren't ever turnkey solutions in life that are that easy. You can't watch a video from someone else or read their new book and it inspires you to become great overnight. You can't just apply some tips you saw in a blog or video to your process and become a juggernaut in your field. Real progress, real achievement, takes real struggle and sacrifice. It's only by setting out on your own path, one that no one else can chart for you, but rather one you must discover and learn for yourself, that you can become the person you always dreamed of. And that's what a hero's journey is all about anyways, isn't it? Agency over yourself and your future alike. And in case you haven't caught on already, the only medium you can even get a glimpse of this outside of real life and struggles is video games. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't make them a replacement at all, but it does perfectly explain why they tell stories so well, why they're the apex of art. When you have full control of a character, it simply elevates everything because it stops being a character and it starts being you. The win or loss is at least partially in your hands in a multiplayer game. The fate of characters in an RPG can be entirely dictated by you. And even in extremely linear titles, how you control the camera, where you look, and where you walk, and how you just interact with the world in front of you can cause subtle differences that cascade into big changes in how you view the story and the narrative. They say art is in the eye of the beholder, and in the case of video games, that means we quite literally are being given the power to craft that art, those stories, out of thin air. And more than anything else, having true power over how a story is told and how it unfolds is what our real lives are all about too. Those journeys we all go on, whether they be big or small. 
Because as fun or impactful as it is to hear about the story of Hercules or some random superhero, the story of us, of you, is always the most interesting one that can be told. And games are the only thing that give us a close approximation of this difference, by putting us in the driver's seat to make our own stories. Have you ever wondered why things like open world games are so popular in the first place? Imagine a book or movie with the same premise. It would be super boring watching the main character just do side quests and random exploring with no end goal to get behind. All other forms of storytelling have to have a main driving goal, otherwise they become totally uninteresting. But when you're playing a game, you're playing for yourself. The story becomes so much more deep and introspective that anything you do can tremendously add to it. So open and massive worlds and games become less of a linear story and more of an easel for us to paint our own masterpiece. It's like the difference between trying to learn Spanish by listening to others speak it and actually speaking it for yourself. Sure, you can gleam a lot of information and skills just by sitting back and watching, but it's only when you truly apply yourself to speaking a language or to whatever task is in front of you that you can learn and improve the most, and also that you unfold a story worth telling and really grasp all of its messages and meaning. You know, another one of my favorite titles, Prey, has one of the best introductions to a game of all time. It's a classic bait and switch, where you realize that everything you saw before was a lie and that you've been living in a fake apartment building that actually is a top secret research facility spying on you in space. But the reason this reveal is so powerful in Prey is because you have to make it. In all other forms of media, it would simply just be revealed at some point. The twist or unexpected thing would suddenly happen, like the ending of The Sixth Sense, for example. But in Prey, when you wake up one morning to discover messages on your email screaming for help and a dead person in your hallway, you have to figure out what to do next. So when you eventually grab a wrench and hit your window overlooking the city and are met with the huge reveal that everything before was fake, it's something that happened because of your actions and quick thinking, not just an inevitability that was destined to happen. Reveals and moments like this perfectly show why storytelling in games is as good as it gets, except for our real lives that is anyways. And the reason I love games so damn much is because of their propensity to craft amazing situations like this one in Prey that really feel impactful because the catalyst for greatness and storytelling was you, not just whatever the writers had in mind before. It's what makes video games as a form of art so special in the first place, because it not only is unique in that other forms of art can't even accomplish it, but also it makes the art more everlasting and meaningful because of the agency we had all along the way. An agency itself is at the cornerstone of growth and learning. And if we're being honest, aren't stories just vessels for growth and learning anyways? Isn't that why we tell stories between each other for hundreds of years now? You know, I've always loved experiencing stories, but also, maybe even more so, creating some for you guys too. Because I think stories are a cornerstone of what unite us as a culture, a group, or a species. And no matter what your favorite story is in games, in movies, in books, or anywhere outside yourself, there won't ever be a better or more meaningful narrative than the one you are forging right now. The one that will cement your legacy, if nothing more, in the echoes of eternity. So don't ever forget to make that one great too. But as always, thank you all so much for watching and leaving feedback about what you love and don't like about this channel. It helps me grow and get better with each new video release, and it's awesome to be able to have a voice in an industry I love so much, even if my opinions aren't always the popular one. And also, if you do want to support me and help me grow the business here, check out the membership program linked in the description below, or feel free to check out my Instagram and X accounts too, where you can get to know more about me and my personal life. Until next time.